Tonight on the Daily Debrief, a dentist shot dead in Texas. And I said, no, no, not Kendra. On the witness stand, this woman admits to being part of a murder-for-hire conspiracy. He was supposed to be paid in drugs and money. And a verdict in the case of a South Carolina woman accused of kidnapping her husband's mistress. It could have been false testimony. Did her own voice from the stand save her from years in prison? Plus, a cop on trial for this deadly chokehold. That's tonight on the Daily Debrief for Tuesday, October 23rd. And good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Daily Debrief. Opening statements today in criminal trials in Michigan and Texas. Both involve former members of law enforcement. First to Texas for this. Stay the f out! You want me to hit you again? Stop huh? right now! This chokehold by the husband of a former sheriff's deputy led to the death of the man on the ground. Prosecutors say Terry Thompson is the man seen holding a victim in a chokehold in the parking lot of a Denny's restaurant. That chokehold left this man, 24-year-old John Hernandez, in a coma. He died when his family took him off life support. The victim's family was confused about the presence of a security guard. and sits in her truck thinking a police officer is there and that people are going to get arrested. Unfortunately, Selvin Young is not a police officer. He's a licensed commission security guard. And while he does have a weapon, he'll tell us that he's not allowed to use it unless someone threatens him with physical deadly force. He'll tell you that he gave Terry Bryan Thompson commands to get off of John Hernandez that he did not comply. Selvin Young will tell you that he himself felt intimidated by the defendant that night. And then you'll hear Mercedes Romero 911 phone call, a reasonable person in that parking lot. And she will tell you that one man is bleeding and the other man won't let him go. Prosecutors went on from there to describe the victim's treatment at the hospital and his autopsy. They transport him to LBJ Hospital, where he's kept on a ventilator and life support. His body is deteriorating from hypothermia. There's no brain activity. You're going to learn that after several days on life support IVs, his body is now swollen. He arrived at LBJ Hospital, 5'9", 214 pounds on the medical records. And when he makes it to his final destination in a body bag to the Institute of Forensic Sciences, Dr. Morna Gosselin will come in this courtroom, the medical examiner, and she will tell us that he now weighs 273 pounds, full of fluid, edema everywhere, and the life support measures that could not save his life. The defense waived its opening statement at that case. Attorney Michael Bryan is here with us to help us understand why. Michael, good to see you again. Nice sir. to see you, Aaron. Okay, so that's a tactical decision. A lot of, of times course. defense attorneys wait until the state is done with everything to give an opening statement. Right. Yeah, they want to kind of turn the tide in their favor. You know, if they if they give that opening right after the prosecution, sometimes it gets kind of lost in the shuffle. And by the time the defense is ready to put on its case, uh, you need to refocus the jury. So it's not unusual. It can be a good, uh, good tactic. And oftentimes the defense strategy will shift a little bit once the defense sees exactly what prosecutors are going to put in front of the jury. That's right. That's right. The judge shut down the live stream in this case, so we didn't get to see anything beyond that point. But look, this is a, a graphic confrontation. The video has been out there for a while. Oh, yeah. There's no, no secret about what actually happened on the ground in that setting. And it's brutal. I mean, uh, it, this is an unreasonable use of force, no matter police officer, former police officer, security guard, eyewitness, it was overkill. Ultimately, it really was overkill. You know, our prosecutors have this video. They're going to use it. They're going to let jurors see it. They're going to play it over and over again. But is it enough to get that top conviction? Boy, that's, that's a tough call, you know, because you've got to show the intent. And I'm not sure, you know, in the heat of the moment, what we saw happening there may have been more uh, uh, heat of the moment versus uh, premeditation, you know? It'll be an interesting case. I wish we could watch it. We'll talk to you again in a second, Michael. Another case with opening statements today is the Michigan trial of Mark Besner. He is a former state trooper accused in the taser death of a teenager. 
Messner faces second-degree murder and involuntary manslaughter charges. 15-year-old Damon Grimes was riding an ATV when officers chased him and tased him, causing him to crash into a truck. The defendant resigned as a state trooper. A fundraising site for that defendant pulled in about $20,000 for his defense team. Testimony in a Texas death penalty trial entered its second day today. Christopher Love is on trial for the murder of Dallas area dentist Kendra Hatcher. Authorities say Hatcher was dating a man with a jealous ex-girlfriend. That ex-girlfriend was this woman, Brenda Delgado, and authorities believe she was the mastermind who hired Christopher Love to rob and kill the victim. Crystal Cortez was the alleged getaway driver. She took the stand today to testify about the conspiracy. Integral part of the planning of this offense. Yes, I was. Were there ideas or things about how this should happen that were your ideas? Yes. Such as? Um, putting the gloves on. Um... Finding the weapon, uh, pretty much um, following Kendra Hatcher. Probably two weeks after I met Brenda, we started planning this um, murder. Um, we would follow Miss Kendra. We would um, stake out her apartment. We would um, sit in the parking garage. Kendra, I mean, we would follow her from her job to her house. We pretty much um, just found out her daily routine. Uh, one of the plans were to inject her um, with the needle. Another plan was to shoot her directly. And um, another plan was to kidnap her. And did Mr. Love have a plan that he preferred? Um, he pretty much said that it would be easier just to kill her with the gun. From there, Cortez described a practice run of the crime. She testified that the defendant expected payment in return for making the job look like a robbery gone bad. There was no disagreement on how much he was supposed to be paid. He was supposed to be paid in drugs and money. Do you remember the specific amounts of um, drugs and money? I remember that we purchased Kush and cocaine for him, and she paid him in cash but I don't remember the amounts. Do you remember him agreeing to those payments? Yes, sir. It was planned to be a murder and to look like a robbery gone bad. He was supposed to take her belongings and kill her at the same time. What kind of belongings? A purse, cell phone, if possible, anything that was in the car. It all sounds rather sterile coming from the co-defendant on the stand, but a witness who was there for the shooting describes it as a commotion. Once we came out, just immediately you heard screaming, but it didn't sound like human, it sounded more like an animal. So obviously we're going to be looking over in that direction and all you hear is, pop, pop, which is two shots and then it's just quiet. So once we heard those two pops, we ran to our vehicle, got in the car. By that time, the vehicle that was uh, up top of the parking lot, it came down, took a left and then went back around. By that time it got behind us, we pulled out, and no, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> let's, let's break that down a little bit. So as you exit the elevator doors, you hear a gunshot? No, we hear screaming. That's the first thing. That's the first thing. And when you say it didn't sound like he was screaming, what was Like she was out of breath, basically. Like she was that scared to where she couldn't really scream where she was out of breath, basically. And then the next sounds you hear, did you immediately recognize those to be gunshots? Oh, yeah, immediately, because it's two pops. What else could that be in a parking garage? And what's your response to hearing those gunshots? Straight to the car. That witness got out of there not long later. After that scene, the victim's mother described waiting in anguish at home for family members to gather to deliver the chilling news. My husband, he had to drive two hours to get home that night. And Jamie wouldn't tell me, and Jeff wouldn't tell me anything. And I thought at first it was Dave, but they're like, no, Mom, no, Mom, just sit here until Dave gets here. And so when my husband got there, I'm sorry, um, he came in the door, and Jamie had me on the couch, and he said, she said, Mom, it's Kendra. 
And I said, no, no, not Kendra. And they said she was shot. And I'm like, what? What do you mean she shot? And Jamie said she didn't make it. And I... That's all I really remember. I, mean, I remember that so well. Back to you now, Michael Bryant. This very heartbreaking testimony, but prosecutors Ooh. have a cooperating defendant who said, hey, look, I'll take a 35-year sentence in return for ratting out the co-conspirators. And, and she was cold on the stand today, but she did lay out the facts. I'm, I'm calculating. I mean, going through the dry runs, discussing exactly how the killing should take place. We got a few options here. And as I understand it, she was only getting a few hundred dollars for her role in this thing. And yet she took it on as a, like a, a job. She was serious. I mean, she was up on the stand giving addresses. She was explaining the types of vehicles that they were looking for, where people were sitting in these these practice runs of this thing. It's disturbing and it's sick. It is. I mean, I, I can see that, uh, you know, she was obviously the right person for the job. You know, Delgado. The right person for the wrong job. Exactly. But, you know, they picked somebody, she picked somebody that w was going to get done what needed to be done for this ex-girlfriend to get some revenge. Where does the defense go with this? Boy, you know, I think uh, it's just a Hail Mary. I mean, it really is. You know, this is a guy that's not going to get a deal, so he's looking at a death penalty. Well, you're not going to plead to be killed, so why not throw on trial and see what happens? If, if one person on that jury can be... Uh, persuaded you, you you aren't guilty, then you win. I'm really curious to see exactly where the defense tries to bring this. Now that you've got Crystal Cortez, she was expected to actually go to a trial, but then when she got up on the stand today, she said, no, I, I entered a plea. I'm going to take 35 years for this. Look, she's 27 now. She's going to be 62 when she gets out. That's if she f serves the full thing. So, so she'll be, a, I dare not say an old lady, but an older person. But she'll be alive. That's what she's got. They took that off the table to, to, to get her to roll over. So, you know, that's life is life at 62 or any other age. Yeah, I mean, I'm really serious, uh, seriously concerned about where the defense is going to try to go with this thing. Because, look, you know, I mean, when you've got a cooperating witness on the stand like that who's going to sit there and go through that level of detail... And, uh, you know, compare that up against a poor mother sitting there and describing the scene of this this woman who went through dental school, was trying to build up a practice, uh, and, and all because of this bizarre love triangle. I, I know. Mean, well, talk about a strange, bizarre, weird situation. You know, we've heard the scenario often where, you know, hey, if you break up and the ex says, well, if I can't have you, nobody can, and they kill the, the former boyfriend-girlfriend. This is a scenario where if I can't have him, you in particular can't have him. He's going to be okay, but you're going down. So it's, it's, a, it's really a creepy plan and plot they carry out. Yeah, I mean, and, and look, rarely do I see a case where we can go through the testimony and present in three or four minutes, as we just did, all of the elements of this thing where we're not left with a lot of guesswork. Prosecutors aren't up there spinning theories. You listen to everything in order. You can put together a timeline. This person says she planned this. Then the eyewitness hears that, and, and then the aftermath for the poor family. Lots of corroboration. That's the key, because you have a witness that rolled over, so that's going to be the attack of the defense. Hey, she got a deal. No wonder she's saying this. But they've got corroborating cell phone. They've got an eyewitness. They've got a few uh, items. Yeah, there. let's talk again in a couple seconds here. Michael, still ahead on the Daily Debrief are the statements of President Trump, an excuse for salacious conduct on an airplane, plus a verdict in the case of a woman accused of making her husband's much younger mistress disappear. Hear from the jury and the defendant when we return on The Daily Debrief. Welcome back to The Debrief, everybody. For more on incidents making headlines, here is Anthony Velez. Here are today's top crime stories trending on lawandcrime.com and across the country. The gunman suspected of killing a University of Utah track and field team member was found dead in a Salt Lake City church. 37-year-old Melvin Rowland, a registered sex offender, was found dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound in the Trinity AME Church. Authorities were pursuing Rowland after he allegedly shot and killed his ex-girlfriend, 21-year-old Lauren McCluskey, as she spoke to her mother on the phone near a dormitory on campus. Roland was convicted of attempted forcible sex abuse and enticing a minor over the internet in 2004 and was registered as a sex offender. Former New York Mets star outfielder Lenny Dykstra pleaded not guilty to criminal charges from an incident with an Uber driver in New Jersey. 
Dijkstra was arrested after reportedly arguing with his Uber driver and allegedly placed a bag with what the driver believed was a gun against the driver's head and threatened to shoot the man if he didn't take him to Staten Island. When police arrived, they found cocaine, MDMA, and marijuana on Dijkstra, and he was taken into custody. Dijkstra now faces drug charges and one count of making terroristic threats in the third degree. A man from Florida accused of groping a fellow female passenger on a Southwest Airlines flight from Houston to Albuquerque reportedly told investigators the inappropriate touching was okay since President Trump says it's okay. 49-year-old Bruce Michael Alexander of Tampa was arrested and charged with abusive sexual contact after he reportedly grabbed a woman's breast during the flight. Alexander remains in custody pending a preliminary hearing and detention hearing. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for The Daily Debrief. Guilty verdicts today in the case of a South Carolina woman accused of kidnapping her husband's much younger lover. Tammy Moore took the stand in her own defense against charges that she and her husband, Sidney, kidnapped a woman named Heather Elvis. Several witnesses testified that Elvis may have been pregnant with Sidney Moore's child. Elvis has never been seen or heard from since the date of the alleged kidnapping. Here is the verdict. Jury to find the defendant, Tammy Kaysen Moore, guilty of kidnapping. We the jury find the defendant, Tammy Kaysen Moore, guilty of conspiracy to kidnap. Sentencing immediately followed that verdict. Tammy Moore spoke and took no responsibility. She blamed everyone else. I was never happy with my representation. I wanted different attorneys. I don't think they fought for me. They missed deadlines with you. I know that Greg was sent by Jimmy Richardson, the solicitor. I never felt comfortable with them, and I never had a way out. There was a lot I wanted brought to the table that showed the truth in this courtroom. And had I not had the things I did have, we would never found like the T-Mosel discrepancy and that sort of thing. I felt like I had to do my own trial, and I'm not an attorney. I don't know how to do these things. And I just don't think I had a fair advantage over any of this. I'm a mom to, to four kids because I have an extra one right now that I'm looking out for. They don't have anybody else. They don't live in this state. We had to leave this state because of harassment. They don't have anybody else to care for them. And they need their mom. And I just, I don't, I don't know what else to say to you. I, I, I am Heather's number one advocate. I want to know what happened to Heather, probably just as much as her parents do. I want to know what happened to her. I know I had nothing to do with her disappearance. I've never met her. I've never seen her in person. And the truth is in the boxes. The truth is in discovery. And they've not even shown me 90% of that. Where Heather is, if they, they know where Heather is by that discovery. And it just has not been brought to court. I wanted it brought to court and, and light. I want to know what happened to you. And they, they need me. I don't, I feel like I'm begging for my life for something that I didn't do, that I didn't have anything to do with. And I wish that there was just a way to show you everything. By delivering today's verdict, the jury apparently gave no weight to how Tammy Moore tried to account for her own whereabouts when Heather Elvis disappeared. I wanted to see karaoke. That's, the, that's my thing. I love karaoke. There was nothing going on there that, that we could do or be entertained. So that's when we went out, we had sex in our car, in the backseat of our car. That's what my original charge was, was indecent exposure. Where did that occur? Around Broadway at the beach. All right. So you had sex with your husband yes. in, the, in the vehicle? Yes. What else did you do? Um, right after we did that, there was a little bit of a mess. He went to a gas station to get stuff to clean that up. So he stopped there at that station. There was some Christmas lights he wanted me to see that were made out of cars that had in them light. He drove out there, looked around. Um, All right. Just typical nothing. So just nothing sinister. So jurors heard that they may also have been put off by an argumentative and some would say disrespectful cross-examination where Tammy Moore, uh, about whether rather, Tammy Moore's truck got caught by surveillance cameras on its way to that place where Heather Elvis disappeared. Do you remember Friday when the expert came in? I don't consider him an expert, but... Do you remember him saying it was your truck? Of course I do. He's been paid a lot of money. He can say anything you pay him to say. 
My truck is not, but you have told people that and led them to believe that over the years. But my truck did not go to the landing that night. Okay. I promise you that on this holy Bible. My Ford F-150 never went to the Peachtree Landing that night. We came home at 310. Okay. But have you been in here for the testimony of the time of the video? People lie, Nancy. Okay. Livesay. I'm sorry, Miss Livesay. What do you, I don't know what to call you. Miss Livesay or Nancy Livesay? Have you seen the video? I saw the videos you all produced, yes. Okay. It's not my vehicle. The final sentence there, 30 years in prison. Tammy Moore was allowed to hug relatives before being let off in handcuffs. Attorney Michael Bryant, let's get your perspective on this. Work, karaoke, sex, cleanup, <laughs> Christmas lights. Mm -hmm. Jurors did not buy that one bit. They don't think she was doing that. They I, you think know, she was doing something else. I think if she, if Tammy Moore had not opened her own mouth, they might have found either a hung jury or, or not guilty. She, mm -hmm. she sunk her own case. I've never seen as unlikable a character as this woman allegedly uh, you know, testifying on her own behalf. It was like she's testifying against herself. She, she's fighting back, saying, okay, look, you know, um, y y you know y you're know, you having witnesses change their story, and these experts are garbage and everything. Like, did, Should that be coming out of her mouth, well, of or should that not. be coming out of her attorney? And she's turning to the jury and saying, all oh, these people lied. I mean, it's so inappropriate and so arrogant. Uh, it, I think, you know, I'd like to believe that our jury system is perfect, that the jurors in this case found the evidence they needed to find her guilty. I don't think they did. I think they found enough because they hated her to find her guilty. I, I don't necessarily disagree with that. Okay, so what do you make of the sentencing statement to blame the attorneys? She, she's getting up there saying all these people are lying. I mean, maybe she wanted tougher cross-examination to come out of her counsel. Oh, that's possible. I mean, but if you think about 30 years for this crime when, when the, the ultimate murder, which may be Someday, the alleged murder. The alleged we, don't, murder. we don't know exactly what happened. It originally was a murder case. That may be part two of the Moore out. extravaganza. Uh, but 30 years for, uh, this is serious stuff. This is not a slap on the hand. I agree. Okay, so the big question here, where is Heather Elvis? A lot of people want to know where she is. And then, then she gets up on sentencing, takes no responsibility, says, I'm really Heather Elvis's biggest advocate. Of course. Well, that was consistent with her demeanor on the stand. I wouldn't expect any different from Tammy Moore than arrogance and condescension to the process. No, that, that's her. But is, is sentencing really the time for that either? This I mean, woman is out of touch. <laughs> you know, She has no clue what the impact of her statements actually means to the jury or to the judge. You know, sentencing is usually the time to beg for some kind of mercy. No, Look, no contrition here. Not her. That is not her vocabulary. Michael Bryant, appreciate you being here with us. Attorney, former Court TV reporter, always good to see you. Good to see you, too. All right, that's it for today on The Daily Debrief. A reminder that Law and Crime will be streaming many of the trials we talked about beginning at 9 a.m. And this broadcast, The Daily Debrief, will also be available on WSB.com tonight at 11.30 Eastern. From all of us here at the Law and Crime Network and The Daily Debrief, have a good night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.